everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rainy day, but uh, you know, I think the rain will only be sp sporadic. So I'm Peter Meany. I'm the vice president here. Uh, and you know, we're so happy to have Eric Johnson here today. I don't know if you saw part one. Uh, it's certainly not necessary to have seen that, but it'll, it'll help a bit. Um, so there's restrooms in the back if you need them. We have snacks over there. And if anybody would like to join and become a member, there's cards over there. And, you know, the membership really helps us a lot because it's one of our funding sources. We're completely volunteers. And uh, so that's about it. Um, so let me introduce Eric. Eric uh, <coughs> was here, ooh, I guess, back at the end of the winter. Yeah, February. February, yes. And he did part one. Eric uh, got his PhD at Harvard. He's, he's really a, a good friend of the Pascack Historical Society. He did a lot of his research here. Uh, since one of his main interests is wampum, you know, we had the wampum factory over down by the Pascack Brook. So he got his uh, PhD at Harvard, and he's now at Brown. Uh, doing a postdoc there in the American, Native American and indig indigenous, I always have trouble saying that, indigenous program where he teaches and is also continuing his research. So, Eric. Well, thank you for that and, and thank you to the Pascac Historical Society. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. Oh, geez. Uh, um, <clears throat> last time I was here, uh, I talked about the story of wampum making. And for those who don't know, I'll, I'll define what wampum is in just a second. Uh, here in Park Ridge and Bergen County in general. Uh, and I focused on the people living here, that is, the Campbells, if you've seen the exhibit out the back at, of, the, of, the, of the Campbell, famous Campbell factory and the wampum drilling machine that's there. And I also talked about new evidence from excavations I did here in the Pascack Valley in 2018 and 2019 from the David Campbell house. So that's what you see in the image uh, on this slide. David Campbell, his name is in these merchant ledgers and his house is here in the Pascack Valley, and we excavated where wampum was made at that house. But today, so I'm gonna be referencing that here and there throughout this talk, but what I didn't talk about so much last time was where these beads ended up. Where did they go after Bergen County? And what fueled the economy of wampum making in Bergen County? So, that's what today's story is about. And it's very much also going to be a story of indigenous history or Native American history here uh, from everywhere from New England to uh, the Great Plains. But just to recap, wampum is a style of shell bead that's made from purple, made out of, made in purple or white varieties. The purple beads were made from Quahog shells that are local to this area. And the white beads were made from either whelk, which is also a local shell, uh, or later on they were made out of conch shell. Conch shell that was shipped from the Caribbean up to New York and to the, the Pascack Valley. And that, I covered most of that in the last talk earlier this year. But to summarize who made wampum very briefly, uh, before the Bergen County wampum makers like the Campbells, wampum was mostly made by native people living in southern New England and the Long Island Sound area. We do know that Muncie people, Muncie Lenape people living here in New Jersey were also wampum makers, uh, but most of the, the wampum that was made in the 17th century and before was made by native New England tribes. It's in the 18th and 19th century that we start to see European and later American settlers uh, manufacture wampum themselves. And this we have evidence for at Albany as well as here in Bergen County. 
So that's just to give you a little bit of a summary of who made wampum between 1600 and 1900. And we're going to be going through that entire timeline throughout this talk. And here you can see some uh, images of what these bees actually look like. On the left are classic wampum styles, purple wampum specifically. Uh, but in the right hand side at the top you can see other styles of shell bead. This style of shell bead is called a hair pipe. It's this kind of lozenge shape, thicker in the middle, thinner on the sides, and longer bead that would have been made out of conch shell uh, here at the, in, in Park Ridge and at the Campbell factory. And on the far right, you can see something called a moon, which is this sort of uh, crescent-shaped pendant that also would have had two holes in the middle. This one's actually incomplete. Uh, but you can see on the bottom then some representations, uh, paintings in the case of the three on the left there, of various native people who wore these styles of shell bead. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some of them. Um, but you can see these, these three images on the, on the left are done by George Catlin, who is a famous uh, painter of native people in the early to mid 19th century. And on the right, we'll talk about moving robe woman a little bit later. But before I continue, while I'm talking about native beadwork, I want to also note that this is something that still goes on today. We're going to be talking about the past, but native people have continued to manufacture wampum, moons, and hair pipes all along from the 19th century to the present. And one of my favorite Examples of this actually here is, um, he's on Instagram, uh, Amaya Creations, who takes, he, he's from the southwest, or southeast, excuse me, and he takes a conch shell uh, and manufactures moons and sells them powwows and such around the country. So the, 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 the story of shell beads that we're talking about, it doesn't end at the end of the 19th century. And that's even true today here in Park Ridge. So for, as part of my research in trying to understand wampum, I also started to consult with members of the Ramapo Lenape Nation, who are a state-recognized tribe of New Jersey, who trace their ancestry to Munsi Lenape peoples that lived in northern New Jersey, as well as southern New York. Uh, and as part of this, um, as part of this work, on the right you can see uh, the mayor of Park Ridge, Keith Mashagna, uh, who was there with Chief Man for a, to, so that Chief Man could conduct a uh, ceremony uh, at the, this park land here in, in public, in, in public land here in Park Ridge, before, the, before breaking ground, before we started to actually excavate and look for evidence of bead making at the location. And you can see in, uh, in his hands, Chief, uh, Chief Man has brought with him here a, what's known as a wampum belt. And we're going to be talking a lot about wampum belts throughout today. But this is an example of two political leaders that are coming together in this moment through archaeology, uh, that, a moment that also involves the types of shell beads that I'm discussing today. So again, I like history, I like the past, I like thinking about the past, but we also have to remember that the, the past is with us today, it continues. So this talk is going to be structured into basically four vignettes that are going to take us on quite a journey through time and space, starting in 17, or sorry, 1676 with a woman named Witamo, who was a Wampanoag wampum maker in southern New England. And then we're going to travel forward in time and a little bit to the west and talk about the Treaty of Easton in 1758. Then we'll move forward in time again after the American Revolution into the early 19th century of the War of 1812. And we're going to talk about someone named Tim Squatoway in the War of 1812. And we'll end on the Great Plains where the 
Makota or Ochechi Sakuin uh, are used breastplates made out of hair pipes as part of their um, identity and also as an expression of nation of national sovereignty. And the main takeaways for today are, are going to split into three categories. When we're thinking about wampum and how it's related to American history, we have to remember that this is a colonial context, that is, Europeans and Americans seeking both profits through exchange, oftentimes involving violence and war, as well as the dispossession or taking of land from native people over time. That's part of this story. On the other hand, we also have Jersey-made beads. I say Jersey-made, I mean, we could say that these are, say, you know, the Campbell beads or white, made, white, people, you know, white people who made beads in, in, in Bergen County because the Campbells themselves were of Scottish ancestry. Uh, but at the same time, the talk last time I gave mentioned the fact that it wasn't just people of European descent who were working in the Campbell factory. There are other people, including those of African descent and possibly indigenous descent, who were working at the Campbell factory. So I'm just going to call it, for now, Jersey-made beads, beads that were made here in Park Ridge and Bergen County. These beads were worn by people, worn by native people. They circulated across different nations and between different groups of people. And they were also woven into other types of objects, whether they're belts or breastplates. And those three actions are going to help us understand what, why these beads are important. And those beads are important because they also were used by native, native people for native purposes. And that's going to be both we'll see through an expression of identity, kind of wearing something that says who you are, and that's an expression of culture, but it's also an expression of uh, a political expression of what nation you belong to. Um, and wampum served a very important role in international relations for indigenous peoples, for lack of a better term. And I'll, hopefully that will make sense by the end of this talk. But to start in 1676, we're going to begin with Witimo, who is a Wampanoag uh, Sangsqua, sang sang excuse me. Uh, who Sangsqua is a, basically a term for a female sachem or a female chief of uh, in the New England area, and Witema was also a wampum maker, and we know this in part because uh, as an, a, a chief, as a as a as a leader of her people, someone deeply connected to the politics of the 17th century, indigenous politics, as well as English colonial <laughs> politics. Uh, she commanded armies at times, or, or, or chose to lead, or chose armies to lead into battle at different points in, uh, in the history of the 17th century of New England. And as in one of those raids, the, she, her people, captured a woman named Mary Rowlandson, who is a basically uh, a woman who became a captive of Witema and her people. And also Mary Rowlandson wrote an account of her experience and her time as, uh, as a captive. And it's through this account that we, we can learn a lot about native people of New England and about Witema herself. But we have to do so through the lens of the fact that Mary Rowlandson is looking at this society from a very different lens. She's not looking at the society from an indigenous lens, she's looking at the society from her own <laughs> cultural context. So when we look at Rowlandson's description of Witemo, she says, a severe and proud dame she was, bestowing every day in dressing herself neat as much time as any of the gentry of the land, powdering her hair and painting her face, going with necklaces, with jewels in her ears, bracelets upon her hands, and when she had dressed herself, her work was to make girdles of wampum and beads. So this is, I, I mean, a very fascinating passage. Lots of historians have written about this. Um, and one of the things that I want to point to here 
is that it, it, if we look at this lens, look at this passage through the lens of Mary Rowlandson's perspective, we can filter out what some of those biases might be and also learn something about how Native people used wampum in the process. So some of you who might know what wampum is or might have encountered wampum as part of history, American history or, uh, or, or in popular culture might know wampum for its economic dimension in the fur trade. This is in the 17th century. The Dutch were primarily the ones fueling the circulation of these small beads that could be used effectively like a coin because they're small. You can, you can count them out and measure them and weigh them and use them to kind of measure value between different trade goods. And for a brief period of time, they became a currency for the colonies. Um, however, this is mostly, when we say currency, uh, this is mostly from a European perspective. So most people sometimes think about wampum as native money or Indian coins or something like that, right? Uh, in reality, native people there isn't a lot of evidence that they used wampum and circulated wampum as currency amongst themselves. They certainly traded with Europeans who were thinking of it in terms of its monetary value. Uh, but the story for native people is much more complicated. It has economic dimensions because again, it could be traded and traded for useful things like metal tools and such. But it also has sacred aspects. It has important social dimensions. And, most importantly, and most commonly, has political dimensions. And all four of these things are kind of wrapped up in wampum. The wampum characterizes all of these, or it's tied to all of these aspects of human, social, political, sacred, and economic life. And actually, in the, the, the image, I showed this in the talk earlier this year, that the belt that you see in the background is an example of a wampum belt where these beads are woven together to create symbols. And these types of belts basically functioned like written treaties that we have today. They express meaning, they encode meaning, they help people trigger memories about, oh yes, at this treaty in 1794, this is what the, you know, these symbols represent, the way in which we agree to rights and access to land between different nations. So when I'm thinking about wampum throughout today's talk and, and in my own research, we can break it down by asking first, how, is the, how are the beads being used? And this is both in terms of adornment and also bead work that is making wampum belts. And then what do they do when they are worn and when they are exchanged. And for me, it comes down to many things, but for today, we're gonna to focus on the notion of identity and international relations. So if we return to Rollinson's account of Wittemo, we see a couple of things. First, that she is dressing herself, that is adorning herself with beads such as wampum. And she is also making beads. So there's aspects of beadwork and adornment that this, that this passage captures. There's an Abenaki historian, Lisa Brooks, who has written about Wheatamo and helped to reinterpret Rowlandson's account of Wheatamo's authority. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from this book, Our Beloved King, or Our Beloved Kin. If anyone's interested, I highly recommend this book. It's very it's, it's, very, uh, it's very well written, it's very powerful. So, Lisa Brooks writes, to further diminish Wittemo's authority, Rowlandson portrayed the crafting of wampum belts as work, suggesting that she was more like a servant than a leader. And again, this comes down to the, the notion of work for someone coming from a European society that is laboring for a wage, perhaps, or something like that. Uh, work in Rowlandson's idea is something that, something that people below do for people that are your boss or your employer or a king or a leader or something like that. But Lisa Brooks says, in truth, given the ceremonial role of wampum in alliance building, this work signaled the highest status of Algonquin society. In this context of war, 
in which the survival of thousands depended on alliances among multiple nations, the making of wampum belts was of utmost importance. Work involved great deliberation, skill, knowledge of community histories and relationships. And this is the, this is the line that really strikes me when I read it. Witamo was entwining the bonds between nations, weaving a multifaceted tapestry of northeastern political networks. So the act of using wampum for native people at this time is an expression of identity, that is culture, but it is also an expression of what it means to belong to a certain nation or political unit. And the work, that is making wampum, weaving wampum, etc., has sacred ceremonial dimensions that ultimately weave together political history as well, right? So if anyone asks, you know, wants to talk about wampum as money, I'm happy to talk about wampum as money, you know, and its value over the course of the 17th century, for instance. But in reality, wampum is so much more than money, right? It's a fascinating topic. Um, and, it, and, it, and every time I, I, I dig deeper about what wampum means, there's always more than I expect. So now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what wampum means for, at least in the 17th century, for um, Wampanoag peoples of southern New England, I want to fast forward to our second vignette, that is the Treaty of Easton in 1758. And as I talked about last time I gave uh, a talk here. In New Jersey, the story of wampum making probably begins 1770, though we're not exactly sure. It, it, could take, it could have taken place earlier. But settlers were making wampum before 1770 as well, probably as early as 1700 even, maybe even earlier. But there is evidence of bead making at places like Albany in the, middle of the in the middle of the 18th century here. And of course, this eventually evol evolves into the Campbell factory. But when it comes to where these beads were ending up, we have to also ask the question, who was purchasing Jersey-made beads? And that is, first of all, governments. British government, the American government, possibly the French government as well over the course of the uh, 18th century, as well as private fur traders and fur trade companies. And of course, through these two, uh, we can call them middlemen, they, beads would end up ultimately in the hands of native people. But I wanna focus for a moment here on the role that governments played in fueling the economy of bead making in New Jersey. So, at the Treaty of Easton, this is one example, one example among many, of treaties that were made with native people across North America from after King Philip's War in the 17th century all the way through the, to the early 20th century. But the Treaty of Easton in 1758, for some historical context here, took place in the town of Easton, which is, I think, just around here in Pennsylvania, on the other side of the Delaware. And this treaty took place after British victories in the Seven Years' War. So this is before the American Revolution. We have the British colonies fighting a war against the French, and native people get tied into that war in complicated ways. And the basic interests that come together in this treaty include the British crown maintaining its authority as a as a, and it's colon, uh, over the colonies here in the New Jersey area. But there are also colonists that are increasingly an, an increasingly larger population at this time who are increasingly interested in more and more land pushing west. And there's also Haudenosaunee allies that are part of these negotiations. And for those who don't know, Haudenosaunee is the term used to describe the Six Nations League, or the Iroquois, of the Great Lakes region. So they were a powerful force in the Seven Years' War. And the, this 
treaty was orchestrated by Sir William Johnson, who was the British superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time. And the result of it was that all formerly Lenape land within New Jersey was ceded to the British government, uh, with the Delaware River being the, the boundary of that land session with slight exception that the, 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 the treaty does say that uh, native people still have the right to hunt, fish, and gather in those lands. But in terms of ownership from a European perspective, uh, the rights to land were given to the British crown and its, and its, and its subjects for the sum of 1,000 Spanish dollars. Um, and on the right here, you can see a map that illustrates the the amount of land that had already been basically conveyed, at least by deed, to Europeans in the New Jersey area here, with a, f a couple of exceptions, including the Ramapo Mountains. But it, this treaty basically created a hard boundary between European land and native land along the Delaware River and, and over the you know, uh, Appalachian Mountains. So what actually happened at this treaty? Well, we have... Sir William Johnson, who's the British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, here he's depicted in green and, and, and wearing what could be a wampum belt or some kind of beaded, uh, uh, beaded adornment object here. He was a longtime negotiator between many different native nations by the British, as, as a representative of the British across this entire mid-18th mid century history. Here's a quote from him a little bit later, but captures the importance of wampum. Understanding shortly after taking command of the post, there was a vast number of Indians dependent on wampum, more than was ever thought of. I found that I should send to Detroit for belts to give them on their arrival in the spring. I had six belts made, one for each nation that visited that place. But I found that some nations required two, some three, some four, as they had towns. The French in their time always gave them belts presence by which they renewed their peace annually. So you can see here how much wampum William Johnson requires in his negotiations and dealings with native people. And the reasons for that are complicated, but hopefully will be clear later on in the talk. So we do know that from this whole period, Sir William Johnson is commissioning wampum beads and belts from areas like Albany, Philadelphia, New York, and eventually Bergen County. So at the Treaty of Easton, here's a, a, an image of the actual, uh, of, a, a, of, of a transcription of the, the minutes of that treaty. This involved hundreds of wampum belts that were gifted by William Johnson very carefully, very strategically, there's a whole set of complicated codes and of conduct of how to negotiate at this time with wampum, ways of speaking, specific uh, 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 symbolism involved in the different colors of wampum belt. I could give an entire hour-long lecture about like wampum diplomacy and all of its details. Uh, but here's one quick example from the actually the uh, New Jersey governor at the time. He says, "Brethren." I'm obliged to you for your kind promises to return the captives, this is negotiation to return captives, uh, which have been taken from us. I hope you will not only do so, but also engage such of our allies and nephews as have, as have taken captives from us to do the same. That you may be mindful of this, I give you this belt, right? So this is a medium through which political negotiations take place. And the last thing I want to mention here about this conference is that uh, it did involve groups of native people, tribes, some kind of usual, you know, loose political affiliations here, Minisinks, Wapandrus, and, and Pomptons, which would be native people living in the northern New Jersey area at the time. So you can see here that the colonial governments are, are using wampum as a way of negotiating how land should be, who has rights to land, and who no longer has rights to land, specifically after uh, war, in this case, the war, uh, the Seven Years' War. Just a quick question. Yeah, the of British, course. The British won that war. So when they negotiated the land deal, why did they pay them in Spanish? 
I actually, that's a great question, and I've never actually been able to figure the answer to that question. <laughs> I, it's a strange thing, and I, was, I also had a hard time figuring out what 1,000 Spanish dollars really means, but that is what the text says. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to figure that out. And by the way, if anyone has those questions along the way, feel free to jump in. I, I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I sometimes may forget some basic information, so. Um, so native people, this practice of using wampum to negotiate is something that native people did amongst themselves, and Europeans then learned those the tactics of negotiation and then applied them for themselves in, in, these, in these negotiations. But oftentimes it came down to um, attempting to establish good faith, establish good intentions is one of the most important ways that wampum is used. But Europeans, didn't always have good intentions. Um, so one example then that illustrates this, this is after the Treaty of Easton, uh, Lenape chief uh, Tidiskung, who met with William Johnson in 1762, wanted to address some of the issues that arose from this because in some ways this, the Treaty of Easton created more problems than it solved and that's a common theme with, with native treaty making across American history. And when T.D. Skung speaks with S William Johnson a few years later, he presents, William Johnson presents wampum in the traditional way, expects there to be a similar kind of negotiation, but instead T.D. Skung refuses wampum. He actually says, no, I don't want you to use wampum for this negotiation. I would rather have my own clerk write down in, pen, in paper what's being said. And you can see here, I think, this in my interpretation of this event is that the, the ways that Europeans had been using wampum at these treaties began to erode the kind of trust that wampum originally conveyed in, in, in inter-indigenous contexts. And it's this case then that this leader decides I would rather opt for paper written down rather than wampum so that there's no misunderstandings. Um, so, any questions before I move on to another vignette, an example of how wampum is being used? Yes? So wampum was basically a picture record of what was happening, and when the governor exchanged it, that was supposed to represent like, what in, in this case, actually, it would be smaller, just single strings of wampum that are gifted with particular enunciations throughout, like particular declarations throughout the, the, the uh, treaty making process. It's a very long process to negotiate with like 60 different chiefs that all have their own, you know, interests and, and whatnot. Uh, and, but in some cases, the end result of the treaties would be then woven into a belt to memorialize that event. Yes, yes, so, mm -hmm. How did they set up the value of wampum? And who? Who, who said, uh, what, uh, for whom? Oh, how? How did they set up the value? Yeah. Uh, you mean when, when, when wampum was traded as a currency in the 17th? It's something that was used for buying things and trading things? In the 17th century, yeah, it, is, it was established as a colonial currency by the Eng a Dutch crown and English crown for a, specific, for a brief period in the 17th century, and those rates were standardized by the crown, from my understanding. Um, I can't remember the exact, what the exact values were, but those things kind of uh, depended on the context. Sometimes they held more value, sometimes they had less as well. But, and that was part of the problem with it as a colonial currency, is it wasn't always uh, standardized. Um, Presumably through the authority of the of the European Crown uh, that's making that declaration. The government uh, got involved with this. Did they uh, set value to it? Well, not the American government. Um, it, this, these would have been the the English and uh, uh, Dutch governments in the 17th century. By the 18th century and 19th century, wampum was no longer used as a standardized currency. Um, so yeah, the American government, it held value as a trade good, right? You can buy and sell it, but you're not using it to buy and sell things, per se. Uh, 
uh, at a regular basis like across the country. There are some exceptions here and there, but we can, I'm happy to chat afterwards more about that if you'd like. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna flash forward. We were in the mid 18th century, now we're going to flash forward into the early 19th century when the, another conflict arises as part of American history, and that is the War of 1812. And so in the early 19th century, we have evidence of wampum that's made in Bergen County that is purchased by fur traders, fur trade companies. And this comes from uh, a letter uh, from Christian Zabriski of, uh, of Bergen County. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but the main point here, this last sentence, is that they're transporting these beads. There's 57,000 white beads and 39,000 black beads or purple beads to Jacob Astor's. And that's a Jacob Astor being uh, John Jacob Astor, the founder of the American Fur Company, uh, who was America's first multimillionaire, and who achieved that by mastering these distributional networks of trade goods that included wampum as well. So by exchanging wampum with native people, okay. <laughs> uh, very ominous here in this dark room. Uh, oh, oh, I, I was misspelling there, I see. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> as well as the Chateau merchants who are coming, who are famously out of St. Louis in the early 19th century. So these are some of the private company interests that are purchasing wampum from Bergen County and trading and exchanging it for fur, beaver fur in earlier centuries, and then eventually uh, buffalo hides later on, as we'll see. But the practice of uh, governments using wampum continued into the early 19th century. At this time, there is a new conflict that arises uh, in this time further west in the Ohio Valley area. And this conflict comes out of the, the Old Northwest, which is the next s section of land that's claimed by the American government between, you know, it's called the Old Northwest between 1787 and 1812. And these land claims and c dispossessions and tensions between native people living in this area, as well as eastern tribes that are now getting pushed farther and farther west, resulted in a, um, a resistance movement, if we can call it that, by someone named Tenskwadaway, who is also known as, uh, in the translation being, the open door. Uh, and he uh, asserts himself as a prophet, a spiritual leader, uh, for, of originally Shawnee background, but begins a religious movement that involves a kind of intertribal movement, or a pan-indigenous movement of the many nations that are now living together in this, in this region. And the main emphasis of this movement is to reject the colonial, uh, the claims of the American government at this time. So one thing wampum does in this conflict is to symbolize and foment the tensions between Tenskwadawe his religious, spiritual movement, military movement as well, uh, that, that, that is located in Prophetstown, which is a, a town in, in Ohio, um, where they establish, a, they establish Prophetstown, this, this, this movement, and it becomes the heart of this resistance movement. So in um, Fort Michilimackinac, up in the Great Lakes, uh, there's a, a captain who reports there appears to be an extensive movement among the savages of this quarter, which seems to carry with it much of the dark and mysterious. Belts of wampum are circulating from one tribe to another, and a spirit is prevailing, it's by no means pacific or, 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 or passive or peaceful. <clears throat> you can see this captain's report, he's getting concerned, there's some um, agitation that's happening, and it's specifically wampum that is fomenting this, 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 this movement. And Tenskwadawa sends a message, sends a messenger with eight strings of wampum, and four white and four blue in this case, but also purple. And that messenger communicates to the people living in this area to say, these strings of wampum come from the great spirit. Do not despise them. My children, 
You are to have very little intercourse with the whites. They are not your fathers, as you call them, but your brethren. The Americans grew from the scum of the great water when it was troubled by the evil spirit. They are unjust. They have taken away your lands, which were not made for them. You must plant corn for yourselves, for your wives, and for our children, when, when you do it, you are to help each other. But plant no more than is necessary for your own use. You must not sell it to the whites. By making too much, in this case, maple syrup, it's a, it's a different section of the, the speech here, but by making too much ma maple syrup, you spoil the trees and give them pain by cutting and hacking them, for they have a feeling like yourselves. If you make more than is necessary for your own use, you shall die, and the maple will yield no more water. So this is a bit of an excerpt from this spiritual uh, revitalization movement by Tenskwadawe, the great prophet here, uh, that is being communicated through the medium of wampum. Wampum, we don't know for sure where it came from. It very well could have, given the time period, been made by people in Bergen County. Uh, but it, I also describe it as old wampum, so it's hard to say specifically. But the point here is that these beads still, they, they, they were not only used by Americans to negotiate land taking from Native people, but they were used by Native people as well to fight back against those claims. Um, and that also involved not just spiritual movements, but military actions, uh, subterfuge, with strings of wampum being used as communication devices between Native people in, in the region, in the War of 1812. And this is an example, he sends, he sends wampum out west to basically Iowa, what is today Iowa, to, for people to, to for, for Native people there to come at a certain time so that they can strike on the Americans when the corn is made. So ultimately this effort was put down in the Battle of Tippecanoe uh, it's where the um, phrase Tippecanoe and Tyler II comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but at the same time, wampum main is, is, is continues to be used throughout this period to both to signal identity and also international relations, in this case, between Native people to, to fight back against American colonialism at the time. So the story continues. Um, just a, a quick example here, the, the government, we have now a very specific, in 1808, this is just before the War of 1812, that a superintendent of Indian trade writes to a congressman from New Jersey to contact a man named Adam Boyd in Hackensack who, quote, furnished the greater part of the wampum used in the Indian trade at this time. So this is just a quick example here to show that the events that I just talked about were happening at the same time that people in New Jersey are being commissioned for making wampum. And the David Campbell House that I talked about last in part one of this talk uh, dates to right after the War of 1812. So the story continues. We're skipping forward in time now to just after the Civil War, and we're going to move to the Great Plains for this for the conclusion of this talk. So the Campbell factory here in Park Ridge <laughs> continues to make shell beads but specifically, they start to make hair pipes, the longer beads that become uh, popular for native people living in the Plains region. And there's a set of ledgers here in the Pascag Historical Society that illustrates the Campbell's businesses, the many different kinds of uh, ac economic activity that they're, that they're up to, including wampum making. And there's one page here that notes, it's a little hard to read, it's a little faint, you can see here this says buffalo. They're selling it basically to their neighbors, a series of people that live along Pascac Road, basically. And these buffalo robes, presumably, are coming from fur traders that are then exchanging Campbell-made hair pipes with native people living on the plains. So we can see there's a interdependence of the economy between Bergen County and as far west as northern North Dakota where these beads are ending up and the value of those beads is, gonna, is being converted to buffalo robes that then are here in the Pascag Valley and I think there's a buffalo robe 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's one of these festival robes here at the Pascac Historical Society. The historical context of the Buffalo Road ex robe exchanges is the Great Plains at a time when the frontier, uh, frontier of war, a frontier of land claims, frontier of resource exchange and extraction is mostly, yes, from North, from North Dakota down to the Southwest as well. And this, this map displays where many different wars took place on the plains at this time. And the one I want to focus on here is the Battle of Greasy Grass. So leading up after the Civil War, leading up to the 1870s, the Ocheti Sakowin, or Great Sioux Nation, that's Lakota, Lakota peoples of this area, they waged a successful campaign against defending portions of their territory after the, the, the Homestead Act of 1862, in which many American and, and, and new immigrants are settling around this area, including my own ancestors uh, who settled in, in western Iowa and eastern Nebraska. Um, and it's during this time that there's also a diminishing of the, of the buffalo, which probably some of you are familiar with, uh, the diminishing of buffalo herds that is the result of the trade of buffalo hides, uh, which native, some native people took part in, but also was fueled by American governments and companies. And this led to a, con uh, a conflict, well, many conflicts across this whole time period. But the one I want to focus on is the famous one of the Battle of Greasy Grass, also known as the Battle of Little Bighorn or Custer's Last Stand. Um, this is a major victory by the Great Sioux Nation of the Ocheti Sakuin against and over the American troops at this time. And hair pipes, those, yes, made here in Park Ridge, were very much a symbol of the military strength of Plains, Native Plains warriors who would wear hair pipes that you can see depicted on the left side here um, as, as a symbol of that military strength. And one of the things I want to mention here is that it, it wasn't just men who were warriors in, in, in battle for the Ocheti Sakuin. But on the right-hand side, you can see a woman named Moving Robe Woman, who's uh, Hung Papa Lakota. And she also used hair pipes. She adorned herself with hair pipes as a symbol of her identity and of her national identity, of her nation. Uh, she was at the Battle of Greasy Grass, uh, fought in the Battle of Greasy Grass, and then was later photographed in 1937, wearing here an elaborate shawl uh, of hair pipes in vertical rows. So you can see there's horizontal is generally worn by men, vertical generally worn by women. Um, but after the Battle of Greasy Grass, the American government responded basically by cutting off all rations and claiming ownership over the Black Hills, which is a sacred site for the Lakota. And this led to further <coughs> delegations uh, and negotiations to Washington, which you see on the left-hand side. In 1877, there's a delegation that included Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, these are famous Lakota uh, uh, leaders. And they and 23 others met with, at the time, <coughs> President Hayes. They were photographed, and it, this is the photograph of that delegation, and they are wearing, some of them, a little hard to see, but there's one on the left here, the bottom left that's wearing, oops, that's wearing hair pipe, a hair pipe breastplate to symbolize their identity as native people. But, uh, sorry, one sec here. It's important when we're thinking about native identity, specifically in a delegation context, to remember that it's not just about communicating who one is as a person, but also who they are as a nation, and what that, the, the rights and claims that that nation uh, deserves in this context. And that process continues to the present. So I'm gonna end here by talking, by just with a quick quote from Robert Campbell in 1888, who, write, who, who says, 
this is at a time where the Campbell factory is going into decline. He says, the Indians is getting scarce. What's left of them is sort of civilized with missionaries and whiskey and the like, and their taste for really good wampum isn't what it was. This is Robert Campbell trying to rationalize and explain why they've gotten fewer and fewer commissions over the years. Um, in reality, however, the taste, at least for hair pipes, not only continued, but in, in some cases probably expanded into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is a quote from an anthropologist who studied hair pipes on the plains, who writes, when the demand for large numbers of hair pipes was increasing, the plains Indians began to obtain bone hair pipes, a cheaper and much less fragile hair pipe than the shell one. Visits back and forth among Indians were accompanied by the exchange of gifts between the tribes. This is the time when they're uh, relocated to reservations, also known as the reservation era, the reservation period. Indians are gifting between members of different tribes. This, these conditions encourage the diffusion of hair pipe breastplates and necklaces at this time. And so hair pipes themselves, contrary to Robert Campbell's claim, remain popular. But, in reality, the Campbells were, in fact, outcompeted by another company. A company that was manufacturing the same style of bead, hair pipes, but instead of out of shell, they're made out of bone. Uh, and uh, from the, actually, the, the waist, the cattle bones, leg bones of the Chicago stockyards at that time. So, the, you can see here how you can see here how the confusion on the part of the, the Campbells, they blame assimilation, they blame reservations, et cetera, for the failure of their business, but you know, in reality, they were just outcompeted. So hopefully, this has um, given you a, a whirlwind tour of American history from the 17th century all the way to the, after the Civil War. But I want to just quickly summarize the fact that beads here are no longer used as in the 18th and 19th century when the when the Campbells are making them. They're no longer used as money by native people and instead they're very much integral to the colonial history of America that is the violence that's part of that story, the wars that are part of that story, the trading and the profits that are part of that story, the land and dispossession. Um, but at the same time even though wampum and shell beads were part of those colonial actions, through adornment and circulation and weaving, beads also maintained native identity throughout these centuries of, of colonialism and helped to maintain uh, international relationships between different nations as well as, in some cases, negotiating with European and American governments. So. Before I end, I do want to briefly mention uh, a, a quick dedication. Um, I, uh, when I first arrived here in, in Park Ridge, of course I didn't know anyone, I was just you know, knocking on doors and making phone calls and meeting people at the Pascack Historical Society, and there's one person who was very uh, influential and supported the project uh, from beginning to end. Um, and that is Butch Servilio, who um, li lived on Wampum Road. Um, he treated me, a stranger who was interested in wampum, uh, like family. And his curiosity and his generosity is really what made this project possible. He even went as far as letting me um, take a dip in his uh, pool in his backyard on a hot day after digging in the sun. Um, and it's this, I, I would not, you know, be here today without his support. Um, he, he passed away earlier this year. And so um, I just want to make that dedication uh, to Butch. And yes, thank you. Many other people to thank as well. But, um, I know I've gone a little over time, so if anyone has to leave, of course, well, you're welcome, you're welcome to step out, but I can also take questions. Yes. What else did they make in the Campbell factory? Yes, um, yeah, they made, they made wampum, the purple and white uh, shorter tubular beads. They also made hair pipes. Uh, 
Uh, they also made moons, the, these crescent-shaped uh, pendants that you, you can see depicted um, um, in this portrait here. Uh, they also uh, used abalone to make, um, uh, it's not exactly clear what they were used for, but they're sort of like these um, pendants that might have been ear ornamentation. Uh, from from abalone shells. It's unclear to me how they got the abalone shells. I have not seen. What, what is it? But abalone shell is a, it, it's a, it's actually from the Pacific coast. I'm not. I don't think that it's uh, on the east coast. It's 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 known in, in indigenous adornment practices uh, of the along California and up into the Pacific Northwest, uh, and it has this beautiful iridescent color, a kind of like shiny, psychedelic almost. Uh, Color. And I, I feel like I'm forgetting some other piece of adornment that they did, but those were the main ones. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Does the word wampum owe anything to the Wampanoag? Oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, Wampanoag, uh, I, I, I think, I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that it, it basically translates to people of the first light. And Wampum comes from an Algonquin word that, that I think basically means white, bright shell, basically. Um, yeah. Is there an equivalency today to wampum, and what would it be? An equivalency today to wampum? Well, I mean, wampum is still used by native people, uh, and for these same reasons. I mean, so the short answer, you know, uh, the short answer is that wampum is the equivalent of wampum today. Uh, <laughs> but it, maybe, maybe you're asking something different. Uh, can you elaborate a bit? In today's economic world, yeah. Yeah. The social world. Yeah. For the white people. I mean, mm -hmm. they yeah, 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 yeah. What is, what is an equivalent, a close to an equivalency of Wampum? Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard people say Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. We, I'm happy, I'm happy to debate all day about what even money is and, and how it, <laughs> how it works. Uh, of course, it requires a collective imagination in all cases, whether that's cash or credit or Bitcoin or Wampum requires a social, you know, uh, a, a strong social commitment to believing in its value, and it's through those then the use as val as use uh, in transactions that makes it real. Um, so yeah, I mean, technically anything could be money if that's if that's the question. So, so is it, it seems like a, a hybrid of money, a handshake, a written document, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Yeah. Yep, 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 and 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 just a, it's just a trade good. I mean that's the thing. I mean, uh, much like 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 what other other trade goods that are being whether those are guns or textiles or pottery or you know metal tools and things that are being traded with native people, <coughs> wampum was part of that whole like package as, and would be sold with that, you know, just like any other trade good made by Europeans. Um, so yeah, I tend to think of it more as a trade in the 18th and 19th centuries. I tend to think of it more as a trade good than a, than a currency. Um, Don't you think Campbell wanted cash? <coughs> he had a lot of want cash. So he must have had middlemen. But, in other words, mm -hmm. he, he would uh, you know, have guys that represented him. And he, he, want, he had to have money to live here. Mm -hmm. he, 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 you couldn't buy any groceries with Wampa. Well, uh, actually, this was in my earlier talk. Um, in my earlier talk this earlier this year, the <coughs> East, it depends on what time period we're talking about. If you're talking about the late 19th century, I think you may be more correct. But the earlier 19th century, um, a lot of economic economic activity took place entirely through uh, barter. I mean, cash was was in existence, was flowing through different merchant um, stores and such. But you can see here the ledgers that are here at the Pasadena Historical Society. We have Cam David Campbell's name. Oh, we can't see it. It's cut off here. I can pull it up a, a little later. But wampum. There's credit and debit lines in the ledger here, and wampum is used. Uh, is in the credit line uh, sometimes because David Campbell purchases the shell from the merchant, makes the beads himself or with it and with his wife probably, and then comes back to the store 
and then uses those beads to purchase other goods like tobacco or dishes and things. But, but wampum is not the only object that's bartered like that. There's also baskets are a common kind of handmade craft at this time that are bartered similar to wampum. Yes. I'm curious about the switch from the shell to bone. Yeah. I'm wondering whether you're aware if that's like a generational shift within the indigenous community. Because I know, you know, as we have <laughs> like shifting, they have less concerns about certain maybe original values or vintage values. Or was it just <coughs> they were willing, it wasn't so much the material as much as as long as it represented <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, it goes into, this is a great question, it goes, you can go many different ways with it. I mean, it, there's a question here about what uh, traditional means, what like an authentic hair pipe is versus an inauthentic, inauthentic hair pipe. Um, I think for the hair pipe specifically, and on the plains, it seems like there are not that many um, indigenous antecedents, shall we say, or sort of like hair pipe styles that are made by native people in on the plains. So when the hair pipes are first introduced, the shell hair pipes made by the Campbells are introduced to the plains, they become popular as a bead, uh, and they are new to them, and new to native people in some ways. There's other beads that are similar, you know, beadwork is common, across the plains, deep into the past, but the hair pipe bead itself was, was relatively new, I think. Um, and so in that way, it's an example of how new forms of material culture, like hair pipes, can be incorporated into native identity, native, you know, uh, and native nationhood. Um, through their use by native people, right? Um, and so when the shift happens from shell to bone, I think it seems as if that shift happens for practical reasons, because bone is lighter and it doesn't break as, easy, as easily. Uh, and there isn't a, <clears throat> there isn't say a sort of uh, native like ancient commitment or like you know, long held commitment to shell hair pipes yeah, on the plains, and so when bone ones are made, and they say also seem to be cheaper, then that's what gets picked up. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. Uh, yes. When the belts were used, um, who made those? That, in other words, mm -hmm. you, do we have any knowledge of that? Because if they had such spiritual value, mm -hmm. they had to have been, you know, significance to exactly how they were made, and they mm -hmm. must have been of real importance and could non-Native American people make them. The weaving of the belts? Yes. Yeah. Well, as we saw from the first example with, uh, we, with Witamo, um, women were the primary weavers, I think, uh, from my understanding. It may vary depending on the context, but uh, women certainly had a, 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 were probably the main um, people who did the actual work white, of... White women? I'm, no, native women. Know. Native women would yeah, be the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Women, so, would, yeah. yeah, well, that's a, difficult, that's a difficult question to answer. I'm not sure in, in, for every case, but I do know <clears throat> in the case of, if we remember, uh, S British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, William Johnson, he commissions the beads themselves from white bead makers or potentially African American, or, you know, in, in Albany and New York and Philly. He gets the beads there, but then he commissions, I think it might be uh, Mohawk or Mohican, I'm not sure, women to actually do the weaving of belts for these negotiations. So there is still native labor going into the making of these beads. Whether that labor is coerced or voluntary, I'm not sure, you know, and uh, whether they knew they were making something that would be used to help further the British cause, I don't know, you know, um, but... Paid, maybe they were paid with the... That they, were definitely, they were actually paid, we do know that. They were paid for, the, for, for their labor, um, mostly just because they're so desperate for wampum belts at this time. Um, uh, yeah, so... But I, I, I'm, I'm sure there are examples of, of, of 
white people weaving wampum belts for diplomacy reasons, but I can't come up with any off the top of my head. Yeah. Does the story of wampum pertain to the acquisition of Manhattan Island, where we hear a story yeah. perhaps of 24 hours worth of beef? It seems derisive in the Western terms, but mm -hmm. I would think the native population that would be a, a safer. Yeah, that, that story, um, you know, I don't know all of its details and how it's, how, it's, how it's evolved into folklore and things like that. You know, the America's first real estate transaction, it's, you know, real cheap land. That kind of story gets tossed around. Um, but it does get, it probably was not wampum, it, it could be, I don't know. I know that beads were involved in, that, in those possibly apocryphal, uh, the exchange or purchase of Manhattan. Um, but uh, what it does demonstrate is a misunderstanding uh, between two groups of people about what property is and whether land can be even like purchased or like alienated from another group of people in that case. My sense is if, if beads, probably glass beads at, this, at that time, um, the glass beads made in Amsterdam or Venice, uh, um, they, they would have been possibly understood by the Munsee people living on Manhattan at that time, possibly understood more as like a, a gift, a tribute, a, um, you know, a little, almost, maybe a little bit more like rent than a purchase or whatever, but sort of a way of uh, maintaining good relations with a new group of people through material gifts, rather than a, you know, cash for purchase of land. Um, it's only later that I think Native people really understood the significance of like what Europeans think property is. But yes. Notice the Treaty of Easton mm -hmm. encompassed Manhattan and part of Long Island, and I was wondering about that about the the fact that we have this story that it was purchased, and how that figured in, into that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, um, I think we were thinking of maybe map, but, yeah. this map. So the Treaty of Easton was not the, f <coughs> the first uh, document establishing European claims to Manhattan, <laughs> per se. That was before that. Yeah. But we have to distinguish between what a treaty is and what land deeds are, or conveyances, uh, right? Uh, and um, that's where so much of the conflict in Native history in North America comes from, is uh, getting back to the story of Manhattan, um, Europeans purchasing land and speaking to certain people that they think are owners of that land, and they think that they're talking to a mm -hmm. property owner, but they're really talking to a, a, a sachem, a chief who, who stewards that land, but doesn't claim ownership over it. And then settlements happen, and then conflicts happen because these rights are, are misunderstood. Um, so what this treaty did formally as a intergovernmental document is um, attempt to or establish e extinguish the native claims to those lands because there had been a series of conflicts around who really owns this land, who's allowed to be here, and who's you know, and that's where the conflicts had come from. And the treaty then establishes it, it extinguishes those claims basically. Um, once, once and for all, quote unquote, except for hunting, fishing, and gathering rights, which the Ramapo still claim today is um, their right, right through this treaty. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Just a comment. Thank you very much for your research. How long did it take you to complete this? Oh boy, um, I started in earnest in twenty sixteen. I think, maybe 2017, yeah. Uh, and then finished in 2021 with the actual text of the dissertation. Um, that involved 
2017 involved doing museum research, so looking at archaeological collections across the eastern seaboard that had wampum-making debris in them. 2018 and 2019 involved excavations here in, in Park Ridge. Uh, the pandemic happened, uh, but that was also the perfect time to switch to doing historical background research, uh, you know, sitting in my, uh, my apartment alone for, <laughs> for three months at least, just reading and writing and researching that process finishing then the, doc, the dissertation in May of 2021, yeah. So, yeah. that was your doctorate. Yes, right yes. Right I saw yeah. it in the Pascal Press. I've never been in a long factory here. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, I think part one of this talk is on YouTube, so uh, maybe if you haven't seen that, then that, you know, it can also make more sense. Where I go into the more details, this is te technically part two of the uh, uh, of this whole story, and this is the kind of indigenous side of that story that spans the continent. So, did you it? Uh, yeah, I did in twenty twenty one. Yes, yes, yes. So you're a PhD? I'm a yes, uh, yes, uh, and I'm currently a postdoc at Brown. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yes. Was there any other mountain factory in this area? Yeah. So. Um, what well, depends on what you mean by factory. I mean, I, you know, um, there were, I will say, household-based, we have, I, I, in the per, top, part one of the talk, I had distinguished between cottage production and factory production. So the Campbell factory was unique in the sense that it was powered by water. The grinding wheels were powered by water, and they had a drilling machine that could be powered by a uh, hand crank. Um, but they were not unique in terms of um, wampum makers in Bergen County. There were other more smaller scale household producers, including uh, David Campbell, who's like the uncle of the Campbell factory owners, uh, who, lives, who lived up in what is now Montreal. There were the Zabriskis, who you saw in one of these letters that I showed here who were wampum makers. I have not been able to find the location where the Zabriskis actually made wampum, um, but there's definitely lots of documentary ev evidence that the Zabriskis, there are a lot of Zabriskis in Bergen County, but the, the specific, some of them, Christian A and Andrew. Uh, and then there's another site called Stoltz Farm that I looked at from my dissertation, where probably dates to the late 18th, early 19th century in what is now Hawthorne. New Jersey, so, and then we know of, we know of others as well in Nyack and as far as others, Cape May even. Westwood. Not to my knowledge, but if you know something, I don't. I'm happy to. <laughs> if there's if anyone has shell in their backyard, uh, that was my main survey strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions up front. Well, thank you, Eric.